Recently, I bought myself this DIY mini Tesla coil kits for cheap from China. After soldering all the components and supplying 12 volts DC to the circuits, we can observe purple arcs shooting out from the top wire of the big coil. The reason for those intriguing looking arcs is the high voltage created by the Tesla coil that ionizes the air around it. But not only is such a gadget fascinating to look at, but it can also wirelessly transfer power to certain devices, like this cold cathode fluorescent lamp. Now the question is, how does this Tesla coil circuit create such a high voltage? And is it possible for us to create our own, more powerful version of a Tesla coil? Let's find out. First off, I follow the PCB traces to find out which component of the circuits is connected to which, and eventually came up with this schematic. If we remove three not mandatory components and rearrange the position of the remaining ones, we can assert that the DIY mini Tesla coil kit uses the popular Slayer Exciter circuit. It works by firstly supplying current to the base of a bipolar junction transistor. This makes the collector a middle path of the transistor conductive, and thus current can flow through the primary coil, which in the case of the DIY kits are just two windings in form of a PCB coil. Now the increasing current of the primary coil creates an increasing magnetic flux density, and thus an increasing magnetic flux, which induces a voltage into the secondary coil. Due to the big numbers of turns on the secondary though, this induced voltage is a lot higher than the original 12V DC we applied. Next, we must add a parasitic capacitance to the circuit which in many Tesla coil designs is increased by adding a metal top load to the coil. But either way, the capacitance is a very small value, which cannot be ignored though, because it creates a tank circuit with the coil that naturally oscillates at its resonance frequency. At this point, the induced voltage creates a positive potential on top of the coil and a negative one at the bottom. Once the negative voltage exceeds the fourth voltage of the LED, the base of the transistor is pulled low, and thus it turns off, which therefore stops the current flow through the primary and the voltage induction through the secondary. Afterwards though, base current can once again enter through the resistor and the process starts all over again. And due to the resonance circuit on the secondary sides, a sinusoidal voltage and current was created in this case with a frequency of around 4.3 MHz. Since we were using a secondary coil with an inductance of 0.7 mH, the parasitic capacitance was around 1.96 pF. And now that we roughly know how the circuit works, it was quite simple to build one on my own, with a couple of common components that I had laying around. And even though the circuit did work to some extent, I was not happy with the non-existing arcs. We definitely need them, which naturally means a higher voltage and thus more turns on the secondary. For that, I got myself two PVC pipes, one with a diameter of around 10.8 cm and the other one with a diameter of 12.2 cm. Firstly, I marked a decent reference line onto both pipes and then marked a 24 cm long piece onto the thinner one and a 6 cm long piece onto the thicker one. Afterwards, I used a simple handsaw to create the two pieces. And because I was not very precise while using the saw, I had to additionally utilize a file and a bit of sandpaper to make sure that both pipe pieces would stand straight on a flat surface. Next, I used sandpaper once again to rough up the surface of the pipes, cleaned them with acetone, and used a bottle of black spray varnish to color them both black. While that was drying, I marked two 13cm squares onto a piece of scrap beach plywood and used a circular saw to cut out both shapes. Those plywood squares will be positioned at both ends of the longer pipe and will be connected through a spar that applies pressure to the pipe through wood screws and therefore holds it in place. 
Additionally, a 3D printed adapter will hold one side of this construction and attach it to a motor that obviously will rotate it. For the motor, I went with a common washing machine motor, since I had it lying around. But before using it properly though, I had to remove its gear system connector from its shaft with an angle grinder. And for the spar, I went with a 30mm diameter type, that I shortened with a handsaw to a length of 23.5cm, barely shorter than the longer pipe. Next, I used a 3mm drill bit to drill a hole in the middle of both sides of the shortened spar. And after marking the middle point of the plywood squares, I used the same bits to drill a hole through them as well. At this point, I used the motor adapter as a template to mark its 6 mounting holes onto one plywood square. The adapter itself was modeled in 1-2-3D design and then 3D printed with my Delta 3D printer in around 4 hours. And after creating the 3mm mounting holes through the adapter side plywoods, it was finally time to assemble the whole construction. For that, I firstly pressed the adapter onto the motor shaft and made sure it wouldn't slip around by commencing hammer time. Then I mounted the adapter side of the plywood squares to the spar through an M4 wood screw and continued by using M3 bolts and nuts to attach it all to the adapter side. Next, I slid the longer pipe onto the system and secured it in place from the other side with the remaining plywood square and another wood screw. Now this construction did wobble a bit around while rotating, but after hooking the motor up to my lab bench power supply and cranking the voltage up to 7 volts, the system definitely rotated stable enough. And the RPM was also easily controllable by applying a bit of pressure which means it should work just fine to wind our secondary coil. For that, I utilized enamel copper wire, with a diameter of 0.15mm. I started off by using Kapton tape to secure the first two windings of the coil to the pipe. Then I pushed a threaded rod through the wire reel and placed it in between my feet, so that it could freely unwind while the secondary coil was formed. After creating a couple dozens of turns, I secured them with scotch tape and continued the winding madness. My advice for this is to use a fingernail to keep the wire close to the previous winding and don't forget to be patient. After around one hour, I was pretty close to the end of the pipe, so I attached another layer of Kapton tape at the end and used it as a guideline on where the coil should stop. As a final touch, I then added an additional strip of scotch tape at the end and the middle of the coil and freed it from its rotation prison. But since I was not pleased with the look of the Kapton tape, I removed it and replaced it with another layer of scotch tape on both ends. With that being done, the secondary coil was finally complete and should feature around 1200 turns, according to my estimate calculation. So it was time for the primary coil, which I initially wanted to secure to the shorter pipe with hot glue. Only problem was that the 7 square millimeter wire was not pleased with that and over time ripped itself off the pipe. To solve this problem, I utilized cable mounts, which I secured in pairs of 3 in a row with a distance of 90 degrees all around the circle. Afterwards though, I had to spray paint the whole thing black once again and then attached one zip tie to each cable mount, which I used to create a total of 6 windings for the primary coil. All there was left to do was to position the secondary coil inside the primary and hook the primary coil up to the slider exciter circuit. Now the result was pretty mediocre at best, since the slider exciter circuit is not suited to supply a lot of energy. But what is able to do just that is the inverter circuit that I created for my wirelessly energy transfer project. After hooking it up to the primary and fine tuning its frequency to the resonance frequency of the secondary, we can definitely see a lot more scary high voltage arcs. But we are still not ready to call this a proper solid state Tesla coil yet, since we still need an interrupter, feedback from the secondary and a bit more. So stay tuned for part 2 of this project, 
in which we will beef up the Tesla coil even more. Until then, don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Stay creative and I will see you next time.